Welcome to Hence the Future podcast. I'm Matamor Cronin. Uh, Justin couldn't make it today, but with us is Michael Kipp. Kipp is an earth scientist uh, studying to get his PhD at the University of Washington and someone who we bring on the podcast anytime we discuss something related to planet Earth and the workings of Mother Nature. So, Kip, it's a pleasure to have you back on the podcast. Yes, thanks for having me back. Pleasure being here. Awesome. And for anyone who doesn't know, he also was a guest on The Future of Life on Earth, The Future of Life Beyond Earth, and The Future of Truth and Lying. And all of those topics touch on climate change. So today will be a great opportunity to go deep into how the climate is changing, what causes it, and what can be done about it. So first to start off, I think I may as well ask a scientist directly, how certain are scientists that climate change is real and that it's caused by human activity? So I think at this point, um, we can say that we have more or less all of the evidence we would like to see when we as a body of scientists want to say we can take it as as, uh, consensus that there is anthropogenic climate change occurring and soon to come as well. Um, so the, the major things that we look at, uh, the body of knowledge that we build this on, first it's pretty well demonstrated that the Earth's climate is set as a balance of the incoming radiation and then the amount that we are able to emit back to space, which is controlled by more or less uh, the greenhouse effect. The amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere we know controls the amount of radiation that basically can escape and it acts as a thermostat. And we know that, amongst other gases, carbon dioxide plays an extremely important role in this. And we have been adding carbon dioxide demonstrably to the atmosphere. And we have actually now been able to use, in the area of um, large-scale temperature data sets, um, data from around the world to actually quantify the amount of temperature change that has occurred since what we call pre-industrial times. And we can now pretty well say that not only are all the pieces there for it to make sense, but we actually can see it occurring and quantify it to some extent. Right. And just to put a number to that, I believe it's something like 99.99% of all climate scientists believe that climate change is happening and it is caused by human activity. And I think part of the challenge is that in general, the scientific community is big, about they're always understating because scientists always want to hedge and because nothing is known for certain. And so scientists have that sort of mindset. But what scientists are often up against are people who just argue their point out of ideology. And it's really not about the research or the data. So I guess as a follow up question, have you ever encountered climate deniers? And what's your take on what their arguments are and what motivates them, and maybe what are some of the holes in their arguments? Yeah, so I think, I mean, the first place to start with reaching either outright climate deniers or just those who don't have access to much information, don't have much of an informed opinion on the matter, is to get the good facts out there and to not just get the information that we do know, but also, this is where it gets difficult, uh, relay the uncertainty in a way that does not make people think we don't know that this is a problem that we are facing, um, but still allows us to be scientists and to hedge our bets and not overstate what we actually know for certain. Um, so what I, I, I would say I usually try to do is cite things like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC projections. These are ensembles from working groups across the world that really try to span the whole spectrum of what we could expect to happen. And they really do cite these ranges of, okay, we can expect this, but within 95% probability, for instance, we could expect uh, this sort of range of outputs. And to just go into what underlies all of that uncertainty, I think, if done tactfully, can help bring somebody who's denying a certain aspect of climate change onto your side. Um, Right. But it's not always that easy. You're right. Yeah, and and I think it's helpful just to give a very brief overview of sort of how global warming and climate science sort of came into the public sphere. So initially, it, it came about when a researcher was studying Venus, and the researcher wanted to know, why is Venus so hot? What is causing this incredible amounts of, amount of heat on this planet? Uh, 
And it became clear very early on that it was due to the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, which basically act as like a blanket wrapped around the planet that store heat. The more greenhouse gases you emit, the bigger that blanket gets and the more heat that gets trapped. And through these studies, she realized that, well, we can study the effects of greenhouse gases on planet Earth right here, and that'll help us learn about this process in general. So she started collecting all of this data and was really astounded by how powerful the greenhouse effect has been. Just in the last 30 years, the amount of greenhouse gases has accounted for 50% of the increase since we first started measuring this in the 1800s. So it's really been accelerating recently. And when she sort of sounded the alarm, all of these other scientists started doing their own independent research and they came to the same conclusion. And I believe I saw one statistic that said that the level of certainty, just as measured by the number of repeatable tests that have been done to prove it again and again, is now approaching and may have even uh, uh, exceeded the level of certainty in physics, like an apple falling from a tree falls in the ground. So it's very certain that we know about this, but there is still a large amount of, of skepticism. You know, about a third of the U.S. population does not believe that global warming is real or they don't believe global warming is caused by human activities. And this has been very deliberately, the doubt in global climate change has been very deliberately sowed in society by, you know, the powers that be, the oil, gas, all the companies that stand to profit and one thing that I find really interesting is that it seems like we've we've it's become part of the ideological divide where a lot of people who are climate deniers, they see themselves as being these pro-capitalist, pro-business, and they see people who are environmentalists as like sort of like, you know, socialist, communist, like they don't really care about business or democracy or capitalism, like they just want to slow down growth and prosperity and it's not really all that bad and They'll use any argument, even if they're contradictory. Like, I've heard people say climate change isn't real. I've heard people say climate change is real, but it's not caused by man. And I've heard other people say climate change is real and it's caused by man. But actually, warming the planet is good, is a good thing. <laughs> so there are so many holes in, in what they purport. And it's really key that we see the motives behind these actors and, and the motives behind scientists and the lobbyists that, that deny climate change couldn't be more different. I agree that making this a debate that occurs in the political sphere is really, um, it really makes it difficult to talk about the scientific uncertainty because the rhetoric is entirely different than that. You would see it, for instance, a scientific conference where people are actually debating about the numbers and the various projections and what underlies them and quantifying that uncertainty. Um, and when it becomes almost a binary debate of does it exist or not in the political sphere, it almost it can serve to delegitimize all that careful, rigorous, uh, quantitative scientific work that's going on. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, you know, I was watching this documentary called Merchants of Doubt and mm -hmm. basically goes into the big business behind sowing doubt in not only climate change, but before that in the tobacco industry. And if we look in the past, I mean, there used to be every major tobacco you know, chairman or board member, they all sowed doubt in the idea that tobacco causes cancer. And it wasn't until they had a leaker actually send all of these internal documents within the tobacco company themselves that showed all the research they had done that proved that they knew it did in fact cause cancer, it did in fact cause heart problems and secondhand smoke was bad and all of these things. It wasn't until that was released that there was large consensus around, okay, tobacco really is dangerous, nicotine really is addictive. And it seems like we're in the same sort of place now where I think eventually everyone's going to come to the consensus that, yeah, climate change is real. It's man-made. It's a problem. We got to do something about it. But we're in this stage where there is still a lot of money being pumped into trying to say that, oh, well, we don't really know for sure. You know, we, I've got some handpicked scientists over here who say that it's not happening. And, and uh, you know, it's a, it's a tricky place to be in. It is. I would really hope it's one that can move away from that and towards more of a consensus before it gets to the point where say right now most people could say they know somebody directly affected 
by the say the cancer that has been sown by you know the tobacco use for instance or uh, any of the related health complications and you know hopefully we don't approach a world in which everyone is within one degree of connection to a severely climate uh, impacted person or you know entity that would basically it, i would hope it, we can reach a consensus before that because that would certainly be a point where it's too late to do much to uh you know mitigate the worst of the effects yeah, and, and I don't want to seem like I'm too much of a pessimist on this because there actually is some pretty positive trends. Like right now, 73% of Americans believe that climate change is real and it's man-made. That's an increase of 8% just in the last year. Wow. So people really are waking up to this issue. And I think the big reason for that are just the disasters that we're seeing every day, every year. I mean, you know, I live in California and the wildfires here were completely unprecedented and it was very close to home. This wasn't like on the other side of the world. This is like Santa Barbara and Bel Air being inundated with flames and mudslides and people dying and being displaced. So it's really serious. And another example is, you know, in uh, in Houston, there were three, quote unquote, 500 year storms in a three year period. That means that a storm that statistically is only supposed to happen once every 500 years has happened three years sequentially. And one of those, year, one of those storms, uh, Hurricane Harvey, was actually a 1,500-year storm, meaning nothing that intense had happened, according to the geological record, for 1,500 years. That's before like, Columbus had come to America. I mean, it's, it's just incredible. So... Yeah, I mean, this is real. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what are some of the biggest contributors to climate change, because I think that'll help us figure out sort of what are the areas that we can make the biggest uh, impacts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that would be worth um, discussing. Yeah, so, sure. so I have I have here just something that, you know, Bill Gates had put together somewhat recently. It's a pie chart and it shows that the biggest part of the pie is generating power, so generating electricity largely. And this is the one that most people tend to focus on, you know, when you think about solar energy, wind energy, all of these new ways of creating energy, that's, that's obviously big, but it's not as big as people think, right? It's only 25%. Um, then we have 24% is agriculture. So a lot of that's with, you know, the cows producing methane, then there's transportation is the next biggest at 14%. Or sorry, manufacturing is the next biggest at 21%. Then transportation at 14%. Then buildings are at 6%. And then there's about 10% of other sources. So I'm curious if through your own research, you have any, any ideas or, or potential solutions to solving some of these issues, whether it's um, you know, the carbon created from electricity, from agriculture, from manufacturing, or, or any of the others. Yeah, those, you know, in large part are, are policy decisions. So the, the one unifying factor, I would say, is that largely from all of those, what we're talking about, these are different sectors that those emissions are coming from, but those are emissions that are coming from the burning of fossil fuels. Um, that unites them across whether it's coming from what we would deem transportation or in many cases, the agriculture, it's the carbon footprint of, say, the uh, you know, synthesizing the fertilizer or uh, I don't know, any climate controlling you're doing and this and that and providing the water and the transportation of that water and so on and so forth. Um, so what underlies all of these is that we still have a deeply rooted uh, dependency on burning fossil fuels to generate power for all of these things. And the obvious solution then that could unite, uh, you know, a solution across all of these sectors is transitioning to a different sort of um, source for your power, something, say, like solar power, wind, um, hydropower, something with much less of a carbon footprint, if, if not negligible. Um, we probably hear most about that, I think, in the transportation industry. Uh, you mm -hmm. hear lots of talk about electric cars, um, but, you know, it really can ripple, I think, through that entire spectrum of what you were mentioning there if we have a grid that is not so deeply rooted in the burning of fossil fuels. Um, so that's, right. that's the main 
thought on that is that the, the main systemic issue is that all of those have that in common. Yeah, yeah. And, and I feel pretty hopeful about transportation. I feel like we've made some really great strides there, especially with Tesla and Solar City, And, you know, that sort of woke up the, the big car companies. And so I feel like transportation is going in a good direction, except for airplanes. We don't really have a good solution to airplanes yet. I mean, we talked about the future of aviation on a previous episode. And one seat on one flight is the equivalent of eight months worth of driving. So there is just so much fuel being burnt on every flight. And you cannot create an electric plane that carries enough mass for commercial flights. It's just not possible with today's technology. You could do things like a hybrid plane where you use electricity for takeoff and landing and maybe while you're going over urban city centers so you're not creating too much noise. But by and large, you know, air travel is something that we still need lots of innovation on to be able to tackle, you know, and you touched on electricity generation. I feel pretty hopeful in that sector as well, because I do think with solar city and just the move towards solar, at least in the U S I feel like we are making some good progress there. And it's hopeful to see countries like Saudi Arabia that we think of as being like very backwards and living in the past. And, you know, MBS said that by 2050, Saudi Arabia plans to be completely off of fossil fuels as as their uh, economic powerhouse. Um, And then agriculture, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about that, because I know you've done a lot of research specifically around methane emissions and how it's related to to livestock and just why why is methane so much more of a concern than than carbon dioxide on a chemical level? Yeah, so... One, I guess, digression to go on here is that people often mention how methane is this scary greenhouse gas um, that has a much stronger you know, radiative forcing or basically just warming power per molecule than, than CO2. Uh, another one that gets mentioned in the same light is nitrous oxide, N2O. These are both greenhouse gases that exist naturally in the Earth's atmosphere, but we are also amplifying um, their emission through a variety of direct and indirect means um, the main reason that they get basically a, a different rap is, is that so what it, what we're talking about when we talk about um, this radiative forcing or warming potential of the gas is basically its ability to trap more heat at the surface of the earth in other words to block the infrared radiation or heat from otherwise escaping from the surface of the earth towards space and you can think of the earth's greenhouse effect as a blanket that exists in wavelength space so the the infrared here spanning past the um so we're, we're in the micron um wavelengths here so past the the visible spectrum and we have things like water vapor or carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that are covering certain patches they absorb at very specific wavelengths but there are spots where they don't absorb absorb and those are basically holes. It's like if you had a blanket you're trying to keep warm at night and there were a bunch of holes in it, hmm. parts of you might get a little bit cold. Now, these other gases can, in some cases, they can cover regions that are not strongly already covered. In that case, you have the ability to perhaps contribute a lot per molecule if we're not already covered, basically, in that range, whereas another molecule, say a hypothetical molecule, could be a strong absorber of infrared radiation, but if we already have a lot of absorption going on at that wavelength, it may not actually contribute it much at that time um, per molecule, as much, say, as another one. So that's a big balance, and it also has to do with how long each of these stays in the atmosphere, so their lifetime. And that's why you'll see different numbers quoted. Some people say, oh, methane's 20 times stronger, or or 30, or 50 than CO2 per molecule. A lot of the, the range of estimates has to do with the, the um, time frame on which you're considering. Right. And what generates all this methane? Yeah, so it's mostly the vast, vast majority of the methane that's emitted um, on Earth is biological in origin. There's a very small amount of geologically derived methane, so from basically rock sources, interactions of water and rock. Um, but otherwise, we're mostly talking about Uh, biologically and not just biological but microbially generated methane so it's mostly coming from the degradation of organic material so 
uh, reduced carbon compounds, so anything that, you know, life, the stuff that life is made of. And when it gets degraded by certain groups of microbes, a byproduct is methane, just like a byproduct of our uh, metabolism. We exhale CO2, mm. so these microbes are creating methane, CH4. Um, and these microbes live in very anoxic environments. They're actually, some people think they're amongst the most primitive organisms that have ever existed on the planet. It's a very primitive metabolism they have, and it's only viable when there's no oxygen around, but also not things like sulfate or other molecules that can be used for energy. So it's very low energy yield, and you tend to see it in, for instance, deep sediments that become anoxic when you've used up all of the oxygen, say, or other molecules for energy, microbes can start to produce methane. Um, but for instance, people often talk about livestock, like in cows. Um, it's the same process going on, it's microbial, but these microbes are living in the guts of these cows and they're doing that same process of what we call methanogenesis, or just methane production in their gut by breaking down the stuff that the cows eat and the cows can burp it out. Right. That's interesting. It's interesting that you said that most of methane production is biological in nature, because in my research for this, uh, I read, you know, the book, The Sixth Extinction, mm -hmm. It's this fantastic book, and it talks about the five previous mass extinctions that have occurred on Earth. And one of them was the dinosaurs were wiped out by an asteroid. But the other four were all the result of greenhouse gas warming that then resulted in mass extinction. And that was surprising to me because it's, I always thought of greenhouse gases as being like a, a very industrial phenomenon rather than being the result of just lots of carbon emitting living beings. Like if you just think about like, you know, rapid growth of populations of animals all emitting carbon dioxide and then the balance of that compared to the oxygen of the plants gets uh, off kilter and it leads to this mass extinction. I thought that was fascinating. And I, I don't know why more people don't look at those previous extinctions as a, a harbinger of what could be to come for, for us. Yeah, that, that's a great point. I'll just expand on that a bit. So the um, it is absolutely true that these extinctions in the past have often, in fact, in pretty much all cases, including actually the, the end Cretaceous, the dinosaur uh, oh. extinction, they all had a warming component to them, a greenhouse gas component to them. Um, most of the time, it seems that this actually, so these are occurring on timescales that are not quite exactly the same as what we're talking about with climate change immediately to, to human needs when we're talking about decades and centuries or millennia. Uh, we view these in the geological past on million year timescales just because that's really what's the resolution we have mm -hmm. uh, in the geologic record for these ancient events. In any case, uh, it seems that there's frequently a volcanic, or in this case, geological source of carbon dioxide um, that, for instance, can be in the form of um, these extreme volcanic episodes uh, called continental or flood basalts, um, uh, basically er eruptions that can last on, you know, not constantly, but you know, with ongoing episodes on million-year timescales, perhaps, um, that can allow a large accumulation of CO2. But then, in many cases, what seems to have happened is it initiates some feedbacks in the climate system, the things that we are afraid of mm, happening. Like we melting the, the permafrost system, and that kind of for stuff. Instance, yeah, or setting off. So one of the best characterized, uh, this is coming much more more recent now to the let's if we look at the last ice age just as a as an example we know i mean very well we have all sorts of records of this that on you know the time scale of going back a few tens of thousands of years we were in an ice age meaning that there was a lot lot more ice and we're talking you know kilometer thick ice sheets over major north american cities a uh, hundred meter difference in global mean sea level uh, i mean a totally different sort of planet that difference in climate amounted to more around about 80 to 100 parts per million of oxygen. Uh, so what we call the pre-industrial level of oxygen in our, sorry, sorry, uh, CO2. What we call the pre-industrial level of CO2 
is about 280 parts per million. And mm. that's what's referenced when we say uh, we're getting so much above you know, pre-industrial levels, which you know, now we're at 400, um, which we can come back to that in a bit. But in the last ice age, we were down at 180 or so parts per million of CO2. So 80 to 100 below. And that difference, that increase that got us out of the last ice age is actually thought mostly to have come from CO2 that was basically dissolved in ocean water and burped out more or less, uh, mm. emitted to the atmosphere on the time scale of you know, centuries, um, specifically from very high latitude. Like water. those thermal vents that all those creepy ocean creatures live <laughs> on. I mean, you could sort of think of it like that. But it was <laughs> definitely a much more diffuse process, of, you know, not the sort that we could just look at. Right, um, right. Our time scale, but on, on you know, century time scales, um, there was a, a net source of CO2 then coming out of the ocean, uh, due to, I mean, it's not exactly clear which sequence of events, but something related to changes in circulation, and the use of nutrients uh, mm -hmm. within the ocean and the the what we call the biological pump, the way that plankton take up CO2 and can then send it basically into deep waters. That got restructured, and in the matter of centuries, we can increase CO2 levels by, uh, say, 100 parts per million, and that was enough to give us 100 meters of sea level rise and you know, transform the planet entirely, get rid of the ice sheets over you know, New York, for instance. Um, and just to put all this in context now, so that's, that's a feedback that you just poke it a little bit in the climate system, and it, then it runs from there. And we, as humans, then, since the... You know, what we would call pre-industrial times, have already added about 120 parts per million of CO2. Wow. So more than the difference between the last glacial maximum. Right. I've, I've heard that, um, you know, my own research that the level of, you know, or just the global average temperature now is greater than it has ever been since human beings first arrived on the scene. And it's true that it was hotter in the times of the dinosaurs, but that wasn't exactly a hospitable time for human beings. And a lot of scientists think that we would not even have evolved to the place that we are today if we started at the current temperature that we're at already. I mean, it's already not the best conditions for babies developing in the womb and, and uh, you know, lots of other key, key processes. But I find it really helpful to think in these long million year time scales that we've been talking about because you kind of get to see the big picture of what's going on and i've heard this metaphor of earth as being like a thermostat especially with in the gaia hypothesis they talk a lot about this and i wonder if what is you know you could look at it on a meta level of earth just basically finding what the optimal levels are for its long-term success of of life in general as opposed to any specific occurrences of life like human beings or phytoplankton or whatever and it seems like it's basically uh, oscillating between having more carbon dioxide or more oxygen and it's kind of like finding that nice middle ground and it seems like what's happening now is that it's kind of like increasing er the amount of carbon dioxide to the point where maybe a lot of the humans end up dying off and then once that happens, there will be more oxygen compared to carbon dioxide, and then it'll reach some other stable state in the future, maybe without humans or with a much smaller population of humans. If we look, let's say, you know, half a million years into the future, uh, or maybe a lot shorter than that, who knows? Uh, but I'm curious what, what you think about, like, just the mechanism of Mother Earth and, and uh, you know, what it might be optimizing for and how that yeah. might affect humans. So I think there's undoubtedly been this sort of close regulation of Earth's climate on million to billion year time scales. Um, perhaps the best demonstration of it actually is uh, this cool problem to think about uh, that was sort of popularized by Carl Sagan actually back in the 70s. It, it's referred to often now as the faint young sun problem. And it basically is just the recognition of the fact that based on everything we know about astrophysics, the way that stars work, um, which believe it or not, we actually know pretty well because we can observe lots of stars. Um, we know that our sun, if we look back at the beginning of our solar system, it was about 20 to 30%, about closer to 30% dimmer. We were getting about 30% less 
uh, energy, basically, at the surface of the Earth. Meaning, if you just do the quick sort of physical climate calculation, it should have been much colder. And in fact, if you just took today's greenhouse atmosphere, the amount of infrared trapping that we can get, say, pre-industrial or even what we have right now with global warming, if you were to extrapolate that back three or four billion years ago, it's not enough to keep the Earth from freezing over. It should have been totally frozen over. But we see geological evidence that there is liquid water, and we actually have some very crude temperature proxies that are now aided by models and things that tell us that there was probably a fairly clement climate around three billion years ago, for instance, and that that has actually persisted. We don't have any reason to believe that other than transient glacial events or even some that were fairly long, but again, on a geological time scale, um, more or less transient events, the Earth has more or less remained continuously habitable and have this has this surface temperature that is nice for uh, for liquid water and therefore for life. And so it's undoubtedly happening that there are some mechanisms regulating the climate of the Earth. Um, now, figuring out what those are has been an ongoing task. And actually, since the, that time in the 70s, we've you know, by then we've more or less had an understanding of the major uh, feedbacks, mostly involving CO2 and the way that the weathering of rocks and the crust can be sensitive, perhaps, to the amount of CO2. And you can get this negative feedback that keeps CO2 from getting too high or too low. Mm. Um, and this is actually what most people would call a geological feedback. It's not necessarily biologically mediated, as would be uh, the case in, say, the, the strong version of the, the Gaia hypothesis, for instance. But regardless, there are these feedbacks that are operating that are keeping the Earth right. within this climate window. Right, because you know a lot of skeptics will say something like, oh, the Earth's been fine. It's been here for all this time. It'll keep being fine. And I think what people miss is that, yeah, the Earth will be fine. The question is whether we humans will be fine and whether the other species that we know and, and love and that we decorate our, our baby's nursery rooms with, like elephants and giraffes and lions and all these things that are so crucial to our what we think of as the world will likely be gone if we don't make any changes. So I think that's a key distinction to make. I'm, I'm happy that you made that distinction. Yeah, I think that's the big, um, the, the thing to emphasize there is that, sure, there has been and will continue to be this sort of larger scale, you know, larger than human scale, planetary scale regulation of climate. Of that, I'm confident. But what we need to worry about now is, are we optimizing for our own survival in the coming decades, centuries, and millennia, and we shouldn't expect anything from the planet to help us or, or hinder us there. We should just really take it uh, as our own problem to deal with. Yeah, so. totally. And I really like the chart that you sent me, you know, prior to this episode where it shows, you know, greenhouse emissions for the U.S. as opposed to China and other countries, because a lot of the times here in the U.S. we think of ourselves as the biggest GDP, you know, we are, we do have the biggest GDP of any country, at least currently, and we think of ourselves as having the biggest footprint. But if you look at the numbers, the U.S. only accounts for 15% of global carbon emissions, and that's falling rapidly. So if you look at how China and India and Sub-Saharan Africa, how rapidly their carbon footprint is growing relative to the U.S., the future of climate change is not going to be dependent on what the U.S. does, by and large. It's going to be dependent on what China, India, and Sub-Saharan Africa do, and Brazil, and you know, a couple other key countries. Um, so I'm curious how, in your own research, how confident you are in these other countries taking appropriate actions. I mean, I, I have seen some, some hopeful signs from, from China, especially because they are much better positioned for long-term thinking than we are as a dictatorship as opposed to a democracy. So I feel hopeful for there, but I don't see any good signs with India or, or Sub-Saharan Africa. I'm curious if you have a different perspective. So I will just sort of quote some of the, the findings or just, you know, I guess put in my own words, um, some takeaways I got from a few papers on that, that topic that really I found um, actually quite encouraging if not 
for solving our problems immediately, uh, at least giving me a long-term optimistic outlook or, or framework for thinking about this. Um, so, like you say, there are these differing trends where, in fact, the U.S., you know, as of late, you, uh, the, the net carbon footprint has been, uh, I think, in the last decade or so, it's been decreasing. You, know, you could put some of it on uh, the you know, economic recession. Um, it's unclear exactly how much is policy-driven. In any case, you see much, much larger relative increases in some of these developing countries. But that said, um, an interesting way to think about this is that you can use just a very simple sort of equation, um, the, the formula that frequently, I guess, gets thrown around in this literature is uh, this IPAT or I-P-A-T sort of equation. Impact, in this case, say, CO2 emission, is equal to population times affluence times technology. Mm. Or if that's, if that's a little too, um, I find that a little, you know, vague, um, I don't know, as a scientist, I want some more specifics, I guess. Uh, this one paper I was looking at, they took a version of it to say that CO2 emission is equal to your population times the GDP of, say, a nation at this level, mm -hmm. times the carbon intensity is a term they're defining, which is basically the CO2 emission per unit GDP. Then you can think about this in a pretty standardized way across different countries. You can say, okay, we have three variables we could change. The populations are definitely changing, the GDPs are changing, and the carbon intensity, the rate at which they burn fossil fuels as a function of GDP is also changing. That's basically mm. how, how carbon clean are you right? Uh, in a way of thinking. And how is and that so, trending? So th this is actually pretty interesting. Uh, now, population is increasing. We know that uh, in faster in some places than others. Um, this study, they took some probabilistic estimates from, I think, uh, the UN to, to feed into their model. Um, GDPs are also increasing, not necessarily at the same rate uh, as population. Um, and what they basically stopped there for a second and said, we don't expect any policies to be put in place to tell nations to not increase their GDP. Okay, and they said, actually, in our analysis, population had a much smaller uh, that contribution to their uncertainty than GDP. Uh, and rather what they then focused on was this carbon intensity, the carbon mm -hmm. emission per unit GDP, which actually, if you look across the board, uh, in their paper, they're pulling data here from, I believe, uh, the US, China, India, Nigeria, and they all were increasing in the early to mid 1900s. And then on different time scales, you actually start seeing in the last decade or two, depending on the country, quite a large decrease in carbon intensity, which more or less says that something along the lines of as a nation develops, it will go through this sort of not so carbon clean phase um, where you're, you know, spend, you're emitting a lot of carbon relative to your GDP. But if you can decrease that in the long term, which actually does appear to be happening across mm. the board. Um, that's really what we should perhaps focus on is more or less what their takeaway was. Um, so right. the fact that that's actually trending in the right way is very, uh, you know, I find that really heartening to see. Um, but the, I guess the grain of salt to take that with is that the rate of decrease that we would need to get to more or less, um, basically the, uh, I'm pulling from a different paper here, looking at various, IPCC scenarios, if, if we want to look at the best case, more or less, that they put out there, um, which the best case that in that one is actually, I think, worse than any of the Paris Climate Agreement. Uh, well, I want to I want to save the best case, worst case, and, and most likely for... Uh, oh, sorry, I, I won't into go the... into details. Okay. There, more yeah. or less, the, uh, just to say the rate of, you could call it decarbonization, the, the rate at which we would need to cut carbon emissions needs to basically approach that uh, a rate that was only seen globally in the Great Recession, more or less in the, in the 30s, hmm. um, or regionally, say, following the collapse of the Soviet Union. So basically, uh, times that were not you know, deemed so great, I mean, right, right. growing, absolutely receding in terms of uh, yeah. economic and socioeconomic growth, we would need to basically have that rate of carbon 
uh, yeah. decreased carbon intensity. So it would be a pretty, pretty large. I mean, thing. it is it is hopeful that we are getting more green relative to GDP, and if, especially if you look at California in particular. California has made incredible strides in the green energy movement, and California has many of the wealthiest zip codes in the world. So when you think of like what is the most, you know, some of the most developed societies, what would that their energy consumption look like? You know, also Scandinavia has some really great energy policies. It does look pretty positive now, especially with California in particular, all of the green energy progress that's made in a given year tends to be wiped out by the California fires and how much carbon is emitted by all of those trees being combusted and the carbon released into the atmosphere. So it is a very global problem, even if, you know, areas like, you know, California and parts of Europe and Scandinavia, even if they make serious progress, because it's so global, and like we talked about China, India, Sub-Saharan Africa being big drivers, it is not going to get better unless we all work together. So I'd like to talk now about some of the potential solutions and how this is going to affect different countries. Um, so I guess maybe we should talk about like, what are some of the actual horrible things that are going to happen to countries in some of these scenarios? Because, you know, oftentimes it's like, oh, yeah, sea level will rise, temperature will rise. But it's hard to really think about that as being something that's going to affect you and your life. Like you might say, oh, well, I don't live right by the ocean, so I'll be fine. And hey, I like a warm summer, so who cares? So I'd like to put some specific, uh, a spe some specific images in people's minds of what this world could look like. Let's say when our kids who, you know, we don't, we don't have kids, but let's say when we have kids and they grow up to be our age, what that world could look like for them. So what do you see as being some of the the biggest dangers of climate change that if we didn't ma if we didn't make any progress that you know our kids when they're our age would would have to deal with yeah i guess i would just preface my response with saying that those that i could speak of most certainly are those on the largest scale basically the things that are globally occurring a global increase in temperature for instance or global sea level change is easier to project than any regional effect it doesn't mean those regional effects won't come. It doesn't mean they won't be severe. And in fact, we know if right. anything, then the smaller scale you look at, the, the greater the chance that extremes can have an impact. Um, but the thing that I could put my finger on as undoubtedly occurring, and we can, you know, we've been able to quantify it over the previous decades, and we can, we're going to watch it happen in the coming centuries, uh, is sea level rise, just because so much of the human population lives so close to sea level. And it's not just that you live there, but then so much of your economic engine has to do with industries that are functioning right at that interface. Um, I think that's just going to be an extremely, uh, you know, massive yeah. uh, engineering feat in some cases to take on something that, you know, New York City is already really yeah. confronting, but other places in the world where just massive relocation may have to happen. So. It is amazing how many of the world's great cities are right on the coast or right by a major river in the floodplains area, or right by a major lake. I mean, that's where people like to live. And it's not, when sea level rises, it's not just like it affects the coastal areas. It also affects the rivers and the lakes because all of the water is connected. You know, the rain comes from the sky. It affects all of our water reservoirs, not just the ocean. And, you know, like you said, parts of New York, Brooklyn, Queens, are going to be underwater by 2050, 2060. It's going to be soon enough that people who live in these parts today will not be able to pass on their apartments to their kids or their houses to their kids. Miami is supposed to be completely underwater eventually. Um, Bangladesh is supposed to be entirely underwater, the whole country. And it's a very poor country. So they're not going to be able to afford to create like expensive sea walls and, and all of these things. Um, yeah, so I just wanted I think, to make that point. Yeah, I think a big question, or I guess the, the important um, thing in, in my mind related to this issue is the time scale on which the, mm -hmm. uh, the 
sea level rise is occurring because at a certain point we can't deny that there is going to be some sea level rise that we've basically uh, the, the term we often use is we've committed by having pumped a certain amount of CO2. That is, if we were to stop right now, there would still be increases that occur even yeah, if we stopped all of our yeah. emissions because there's still warming going on. The, the system has some basically inertia in that sense. Right. Um, well, let's let's get into that. So I think now let's do the future scenarios because then we can talk about the time scales of if it happens in the shortest time scale, that's the worst case. And then the best case will be a much longer time scale. And then most likely is what will be what the research really projects with our current trajectory. So let's take a super quick break and then we'll get into the future scenarios. All right, so let's start with the worst case scenario. Worst case scenario. So what do you think is the time scale and the effects in the worst case scenario for the future of climate change yeah, so the worst case scenario that you know gets put basically in this ensemble of uh, what the IPCC puts out and what they call RCPs or uh, representative concentration pathways, basically different possible futures of climate. Uh, they give us more or less this best case, worst case, most likely scenario. They don't mm -hmm. call them that. They sort of refer to them all as just a scenario that is based on uncertainty and what happens in the, in the socioeconomic engine that is the world. Um, so the worst case, one that frequently gets cited is this RCP 8.5 scenario. These numbers are referring to uh, the equilibrium climate increases um, that occur on longer time scales. So that this one being 8.5 degrees, um, not necessarily by at the end of the century, it'd be more on the order of, uh, I think, something like four uh, or five degrees C. Uh, I'd have to double check that exact figure. But in any case, what this one, let's, we were just talking about sea level rise. Um, the projected sea level rise under this scenario, the most likely, or I guess, you know, in the, in the worst case scenario, uh, is on the order of half a meter to a meter of global sea level rise by the end of the century. Hmm. Um, and if we were saying absolute worst, worst case, they, they do make a note in the IPCC report. They say this actually doesn't account for the possibility of a catastrophic collapse of um, Antarctic ice sheets that basically could initiate or allow a much more rapid, uh, more or less just flowing of ice into the ocean, uh, which they think would not increase it by more than a meter. They said maybe several tenths of a meter additionally beyond that. Right. So it but seems now, now when people say like, you know, when people hear it's going to increase by a meter, that can I could see a lot of people thinking, hey, that's not that bad. You know, the beach will be a meter closer to us. But one thing that I think a lot of times people forget is that it's not like it's this very gradual process where every year it's a quarter of an inch rise and it's something that happens slowly enough that you don't really notice it. It tends to be things that happen in, in spurts like massive, you know, hurricanes will come in and totally flood New Orleans. And the city is just unlivable for months. And then if it gets to the point where these hurricanes happen frequently enough that there's not enough recovery time, then you pretty much just got to say, okay, New Orleans was a great city. It's not habitable anymore. And the same thing could happen to Miami. Same thing could happen to Bangladesh. So so do you see it along those lines where it's it's not like this very gradual change, but it is something that happens with these big events that become more and more frequent? I think so. I guess those are two aspects to emphasize about this, because in one sense, it is a gradual increase that is occurring um, more or less. When we're looking at the long time scale here, there is a gradual increase. I mean, that we're talking usually about millimeters when we're talking about annual Right, increases right. in sea level and it is because there is annual consistent incremental uh, mass loss from the uh, these ice sheets that's not to say though that much of the risk so what we are afraid of as a human you know ecosystem living in these places are the extreme events because say one day you know water starts to encroach on your city and uh, that's not a catastrophe necessarily yet but as soon as a storm comes through with high energy that then has the water just that little bit closer in some cases, that can make a world of difference. 
in terms of hazards. So I think, yeah, that also is an important component of it. Um, and for instance, we've already seen cases like Hurricane Sandy in New York, where this the extent of flooding was just, you know, extremely damaging. And if you can just imagine bringing the water table closer to so many of these structures, then you're just increasing your hazard by some amount for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. I mean, I think as far as my own worst case scenario, so the sea level rise definitely is part of it. So a lot of coastal communities and island nations like Bangladesh will be under in serious trouble and that'll create a lot of climate refugees. I've seen, I've seen stats as much as 1 billion climate refugees by the end of the century in the worst case which when you think about the Syria crisis, I mean, that's a fairly small population relative to what we could see in the future. And a lot of the Syrian refugee crisis was caused by famine, which is the result of lands getting hotter so that they cannot grow food nearly as well. And especially in areas in parts of the Middle East already, you pretty much just can't grow crops. I mean, you can grow weeds, weeds that flourish in high carbon environments, but most of the foods we like, most of the plants we like to grow, require a lot of oxygen. So famine is going to be a big issue. Drought is going to be a big issue. Hurricanes and heat waves. I've heard that in parts of India and the Middle East and Mecca, you will not be able to go outside in the summer. It will be up to 130 degrees Fahrenheit and you will just get just, you know, <laughs> like sunburns like you wouldn't believe and passing out and dying of heat stroke and all of these things, even if you just go outside. So these are all things that, that could happen. And I guess the way that I thought about the worst case, best case, and most likely, so I definitely looked at the projection. So I, I found similar numbers where, you know, it's something like in the worst possible case, it would be like eight degrees change Celsius by the end of the century. But I also looked at what the response is. And the response in the worst case is doubt. So people not acting because they only care about short term economic growth. And it's sort of this tragedy of the commons where it, it would be really good if for all of us to make a change. But because we can't really have uh, accountability, no one really makes a big enough change. And then the, the catastrophes get so dire and so frequent that we end up having very limited choices left. And I've heard of some possible quote unquote solutions that seem almost like a dystopia where, for instance, one solution I heard about is that, hey, if we just pump a bunch of sulfur into the atmosphere, that will reflect a lot of the sunlight and that will lead to cooling. And, you know, so that could be a potential like last ditch effort to stop global warming. But the problem there is that, first of all, sulfur smells terrible. Second of all, the sky would turn red and the trees would turn brown and it just would be like hell on earth, basically. And the other thing is that if we have this big facility that puts all the sulfur into the atmosphere or if we have a decarbonizing uh, facility, which is another solution I've heard about, where basically pumps carbon out of the atmosphere, those facilities could be at big risk for a terrorist attack or for some rogue nation to drop a bomb on it. And if that happened, and if these facilities that were basically masking the effects of global climate change by a couple degrees all of a sudden went out, that would be like the absolute worst case scenario where it would just be this rapid domino effect and it would end up basically with a small population um, of people living very much like Sandy from SpongeBob SquarePants in a glass domed building where, like, you know, you don't really want to go outside, but so long as you stay in this domed environment, you'll be okay. Like, in my mind, that would be the worst case. It's always more inventive than the scientist's worst case. <laughs> yeah, I like to keep it a little theatrical. All right. Yeah, right. Do, you, do you have anything to add to that or do you want to get into the best case now? Um, well, I would just say that I guess two quick things. One is that when discussing or throwing out this worst case in the, say, the IPCC report, what they're basically accounting for is that, yeah, this is the worst case we can imagine in the sense that 
even trends that we are observing right now, such as the decrease in carbon intensity, you know, in nations across the world, um, even though we see that they're saying in this worst case, that's not going to happen. In fact, it's actually going to increase. Uh, I don't know about if they're factoring carbon intensity and in, as the variable itself, but for instance, the, you know, the emissions per uh, country are actually increasing. So it's not necessarily even business as usual per se. It's um, so in that sense, right. there's a reason to say that it may not be, you, know, you may not have to fear it as much as you think, even though it is certainly mm. possible. Um, the other one, maybe this will segue us into the into the best case, is what you said about those possible mechanisms for uh, you know, geoengineering, in a sense, for actually actively trying to combat the warming in a way that so the, the two ways we have are one, stop emitting, and the other one, do something about the impact either by sequestering the carbon or by, say, something like the sulfate aerosols. Yeah, it's like if you're getting... If you're becoming obese because you keep eating food that's unhealthy for you, one solution is stop eating unhealthy food. The other solution is keep eating whatever you want and just get liposuction every, you know, it's like, it's like, obviously it's not the best solution, but you know, it's better than doing nothing. <laughs> yeah. So the, you know, that can feed into both the best and worst case scenarios. Cause like you mentioned, there are, you know, unintended side effects, there are vulnerabilities to these. Um, but when we, if we start to consider then what is our best case, for instance, what the uh, the rhetoric in the Paris Climate Agreement was discussing, they were saying we are trying to get well below a global temperature increase of two degrees C by the end of the century. Their goal ideally was more like one and a half degrees C. Not that that doesn't come without problems, but that is seemingly what it sounds like now, the best we can really hope for. Yeah. And that includes in there total carbon neutrality, if not actually carbon deficit, by the second half of this century. Um, so that more or less necessitates some sort of uh, geoengineering. Right. Um, and this, and so, this is also, it's useful to say that this is a logarithmic scale. It's not a direct linear scale as far as the effects of one degree versus two degrees. It's two degrees is more than twice as bad, at least from, from my research. I mean, I have this chart here that says that with 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming versus two degrees, the difference in fresh water would be, in the first case, a 9% decrease in fresh water, and in the second case, a 17% decrease in fresh water availability. Um, and there's, you know, there's many other uh, levels here about sea level rise, crop yields, coral bleaching, rainfall, heat waves. So it may seem very small to do one degree or half a degree, but in fact, it, it's like a doubling effect. It has exponential uh, impacts. Yeah, I'd say the the numbers, you know, they get thrown out. Are we below two or below 1.5 or four degrees? It's very hard to have an intuitive grasp of what that means, and that you could argue about the utility of having such cutoffs. Um, it is nice to have a goal, I think, to ban towards, but you're right that it can sound like you know, we could maybe just miss the 1.5. Yeah, two, three and degrees. Two isn't so yeah. bad. Yeah. And that does really uh, miss a lot of the problems that can get quite a bit worse. Uh, and it depends on each aspect, uh, some of which ramp up much quicker as a function of temperature than others. So that's a good point for sure. Yeah. And I just have one other point on the worst case, and then we can get into the, the happier perspective. But in the worst case, the other factor is disinformation. And we talked about this a little bit at the beginning of the episode, you know, merchants of doubt and, and the powers that be sowing doubt. And I think one key factor here are that some countries are going to benefit from global warming. Russia is going to benefit from global warming. Canada is going to benefit from global warming. Some of the Nordic countries are going to benefit. But in particular with Russia, I feel like, you know, they have a very like, fuck you to the world sort of mentality, um, you know, kind of similar to Trump's mentality or Bolsonaro or, you know, there are certain leaders around the world that are just kind of like super nationalistic, just looking out for number one, like think that anyone who cares about the environment is a pansy, like that whole mindset. I could see a situation where there's a big disinformation campaign, especially by a lot of the Russian bots and all of that. 
where it, it really tries to convince people to take a more nationalistic approach. And in the worst case, I see like, a bunch of countries led by different versions, different iterations of Trump, like different kind of nationalistic mentality, um, especially like the leader of Brazil recently came out saying that with his plan for the government, they will deforest the Amazon rainforest to create a profit for Brazil. And the Amazon rainforest creates 30 percent of the world's oxygen supply. And he's like looking like looking around and saying, hey, we got these resources. We got all of these trees. Why are we letting other nations be wealthy? Why don't we just chop up all these trees, sell them and take the profits for ourselves? Like this is about Brazil, like Brazil first. We're going to be nationalistic, you know, and I could see that trend becoming stronger and stronger in the worst case. In the worst case, which I think would have to stem from some level of disinformation just about the impacts of climate change, because even in the cases where you can speculate that there are benefits to certain nations, that nobody will be immune to a lot of the worst right, effects. Right. Um, and so, I mean, people in Russia died of heat stroke last year. Russia, it's like a cold place. <laughs> yeah, you know, so, it, yeah, it's a complicated thing that I think it's a very difficult claim to make that there is a net benefit for, for really anyone. In right. This. But you, I mean, if you would be able to grow more crops in Siberia, for instance, whereas currently and in the past, it's been someplace that cannot create any wealth. And for instance, like I've heard that regions in France and Spain where some of the best, greatest wine and champagne that's enjoyed from around the world, they're no longer going to be able to grow grapes and have vineyards for wine because the temperatures just aren't right. And so like places like Russia might end up being the next great place for wine. So there, there are some benefits, but I totally agree with you that it's not across the board. Everyone's going to be affected in some way. Yeah, and I, that's why it's great that countries like Canada are sort of leading the charge, even though they do kind of stand to benefit a little bit. Yeah, because once you factor in things like the level of infrastructure that would need to be developed to take use of perhaps just the change in temperature, let alone, you know, you need to have the right soil for the agricultural to be viable and all of these things that yeah. just a simple increase in temperature may not translate into so much of a profit. But but the other the other reason why I think the nationalistic piece really is a big factor is that there's going to be a ton of climate refugees regardless. And if every country is just like, you know, clutching its own pearls and and just not caring about anyone else, then a lot more people are going to die than if we take a more global collaborative approach. So I, I especially fear for the the poorer nations, because with the exception of Australia, all of the nations that are going to see the greatest temperature increase are those countries with the lowest GDPs. So I, I very much fear for these people. But anyways, that's a good place to punctuate the worst case. And now let's get into the best case scenario. Best case scenario. Yeah. So what so, do you think is the best case for climate change? Yeah. So again, sort of, you know, hinging off these uh, reports, IPCC and also the Paris Climate Agreement. Uh, now, what is laid out, for instance, in the Paris Climate Agreement as the goal, they're not saying, oh, this is the best case we can ever hope for. They're saying this is what we must do. Um, I would consider the best case, which is something on the on the order of 1.5 degrees C warming uh, or an upper uppermost limit up to. Um, now, again, what that translates into in terms of uh, impacts, we can speculate on uh, on the regional level and have some uncertainty, but quantified. Um, so, you know, when we were thinking about on the on the global scale for things like sea level rise, but I think just one one thing to point out. Let's say this is the best case. We want to hit that 1.5 number. Uh, some people have done the experiment where they just you know they take some of these climate models and they say, all right, this isn't the most realistic thing, but let's say that tomorrow we just stop all carbon emissions. It's just done. And then what's the 
you know, again, the committed increase in temperature that's still to come. Right. And in most cases, actually, it seems that that we would still be below one and a half. And you'd think, oh, OK, well, we should sure hope we're still below one and a half. But actually, if you do that, not all of the cases still end up uh, below some end up above that threshold. And if you then do the experiment where you say, OK, we don't just stop everything today, but you actually don't build any new infrastructure for burning fossil fuels. We just use everything to the end of its lifetime. Hmm. there are still some of those scenarios that would end up above the 1.5 degree threshold. And so what we basically are left with is saying, if we want to get to this, you know, this Paris agreement sort of world, we got to build a time machine (laughs) or (laughs) Or do some carbon sequestration. Right. Right. Anything else. So in, in the best case, I think it does exist. It's not implausible, but I think what it requires is decisive action in like starting this decade to decarbonize economies across the globe. And then in the second half of the century, it probably also involves carbon sequestration. And I think of the two geoengineering options, uh, while both could be effective at decreasing temperature, if we're talking about best case, it seems a little more pleasant to uh, sequester carbon in the form of you know, carbonate mineral that could be stored perhaps in the subsurface is what people are, I think, speculating on, and as opposed to having to inject sulfur uh, you know, sulfur dioxide, which form these sulfate aerosols and the right. stress, cause things like acid rain. Yeah, I've I've read that for us to keep under that two degrees increase threshold, we would have to globally rally around this cause to the same degree that we rallied around World War II. Mm-hmm. Like, we would have to mobilize and take a big enough, you know, economic hit personally for the greater good that we had to take in World War II. And so it seems very unlikely that we'll do that, especially since, you know, 30% of people don't even really believe in climate change or they've been duped or whatever. And, you know, another thing that's not very hopeful, I guess it's supposed to be the best case, so I don't want to be too down, but there's a, la- there's a poll recently that shows that even though 73% of Americans believe in climate change and believe we should do something, very small percentage would be willing to even donate a dollar per month to climate efforts. And almost no one would donate $10 a month. I mean, you pay more for Netflix. <laughs> this is for the fate of the planet. That's so, a good, um, I like this, this point you bring up though. It reminds me that I think when talking about this best case, um, and we can you know, be more or less optimistic about it, depending which aspect of it you bring up. But I think, a point that underlies it is how would we achieve it? How would it be economically viable? And that point you bring about the cost, for instance, per person, per month or anything, the personal cost of such a thing is an important one because I think, let's say, for instance, we're doing this carbon sequestration program, really ambitious, um, even in the best case where it's internationally distributed and so it's not so vulnerable to an attack in one place, but it's still very expensive. Uh, And we still, let's say, this is the second half of the 21st century, and we need to be carbon negative at this point to stay in this trajectory. But we still don't have the ability to, for instance, have electric uh, commercial flights. So we still need to burn a lot of fossil fuel to get people around the globe. And in such a globalized world, you're still going to have a lot of that travel. So you're having this associated cost then of carbon sequestration per, say, flight, and I would, I mean, one thing that people have talked about quite a bit and I think would have to be part of it is some level of carbon tax where you're basically paying in your cost for gas, in your cost for an airline ticket, all this for the removal of said carbon. From right. The and, and the first step is not even, in my opinion, a carbon tax, but it's to stop subsidizing the oil and, and gas companies. People don't, a lot of people don't know this, but the U.S. government and governments around the world, they're already subsidizing oil and gas as much as $3 trillion a year. And the latest numbers I saw is that if we wanted to be carbon neutral, it would cost about $5 trillion a year, just within the U.S. alone. And so this is like something that we could do, but we're, right now we're going so far in the opposite direction of what we should be doing and the argument is always like, hey, you know, Americans really need low gas prices. This is about the economy. This is about hardworking Americans being able to fill up their tank. And it's like, 
And but what you're doing is you're creating a market, you're, you're hiding the real market effects in the wrong direction. And it's pretty terrible. And, you know, the funny thing, I like to think a lot about the multiverse and different paths that we could have taken as a society. And if you look at from the year 2000, when Al Gore won the popular vote, if he had become president and enacted the policies that he set out in his ag campaign agenda, all we would have had to do is have a 2% improvement each year from the year 2000. Now, we need a 10% improvement each year. And if we wait another decade before we do anything, it'll be a 30% improvement that will, will be required. So the longer we wait, the more it's going to hurt our, not only our planet, but our economy as well. And I have no doubt that eventually people will realize, oh, shit, this is actually really affecting our, our wallets. It's not just about, you know, the poor people and the, the animals and our planet. It's really about the economy now, too. But by the time that happens, we're going to have been, you know, such a slow start that it, it's really going to be such an almost impossible game of catch up. And I wonder, like, there's probably is a... a universe in the multiverse where Al Gore got elected, we took that path, and our kids and grandkids will be running, frolicking in the fields, and <laughs> instead they're going to be sitting under a red sulfur sky, like in the Matrix, like when they, like, I mean, obviously it, it might not be that bad, but it, it could be really bad, and enough people have painted a rosy picture of this that I feel like there should be more people talking about the dangers, because you know, World War, people didn't rally around World War II because they were hopeful about a new world. They rallied around it because they were terrified about a fascist dominated Nazi controlled world. So I think well, fear is a powerful motivator. You know, that's an interesting point you make. And I guess before we get into what we consider the, the best case, then I would like to maybe frame that as a question to you, because being someone who discusses this issue with scientists frequently, and I can see, you know, a an article that comes out that sort of embellishes in the worst case or sort of just favors the the really scary vision of the future and I can get a bit frustrated saying well you're maybe not painting the most accurate portrayal of the current facts and uncertainties and you know I, I would like to play it closer to what we we think we know because it, to me uh, the the danger of embellishing is perhaps that you put off the people who are so far to the other side that they can use it as, you know, firearms against you, basically, as, as ammunition against you. But I'd be interested to hear if you think what, what you think the yeah. best strategy is to, to get this sort of global uh, movement that we clearly need. Right. Well, I do think that it's counterproductive to make claims that are wildly out of the po realm of possibility. Like, for instance, there was one book that was written about the population explosion in the 1970s that basically made the claim that in the next 10 years, the world is going to go to shit because there's going to be too many people. We're not going to be able to feed them. And guess what? That didn't happen. Big reason why it didn't happen is because we invented GMO foods and we were able to have vastly increased crop yields compared to what was previously projected. So there are ways that we can have a much better scenario than what the current science predicts. However, if no one's, if, if it's not going to happen just on its own, like this is not something that just will take care of itself. It really requires people to mobilize and fear is one of the most powerful motivating factors. I mean, we should use every motivating factor we possibly can. So hope motivates some people, whereas fear motivates others. But even if it's the case that climate change is not caused by human activity, that's even more terrifying. And we should be even more geared up to make a difference if it's something that Mother Earth is doing on its own, regardless of, of what we're doing. So I, no matter what way you look at it, I think it's, it's important that we mobilize people with the facts. Like, I'm not saying we should, we should uh, embellish the facts, but I'm saying we should paint an accurate picture of what could foreseeably happen and then identify the biggest chunks of areas of improvement that we can make and then tackle those areas. That's why I love people like Bill Gates, you know, create a whole fund and put out a message to get as many climate innovators inspired and ready to create businesses to take on these challenges. 
So anyways, just bringing this together into what I think the best case scenario is, the best case scenario is everyone rallying together. It's people waking up and like, for instance, we've seen an 8% increase in people who are aware and know we need to do something about climate change just in the last year. Let's take that trend and push that forward. In a couple of years, let's say three years from now, basically everyone is on the same page. And at that point, we are, we are able to make enough changes that I, I really don't think it's possible that we stay under two degrees, but we could keep it under three degrees in the best case for, for, for what I've been looking at. And if that happens, and if we move away from the nationalism point of view and towards a more globalistic, collaborative, like, hey, we're all in this together point of view, then I think we could minimize the amount of deaths as a result of catastrophes, flooding, heat waves, um, disease. I mean, one thing we didn't talk about is that a lot of diseases are trapped in the ice and they can be released when the ice melts. Diseases that haven't been around for thousands of tens of thousands of years that we have no immunity towards. And there's also way more insects when it's a warmer climate. And so we could have issues of malaria in Chicago. And, you know, so, so there are some bad things that are going to happen regardless, but we could seriously minimize the effects and have enough places on earth that are still okay that people can move to those places and we can pretty we can more or less pass on a similar world to our kids is my best case scenario and that's the one that i'm really hoping we get towards like I, I, in my mind i expect us to get to the best case even if it seems unlikely because that's what will need to happen for us to give our kids the same sort of world that we live in and that we enjoy today Yeah, I think so. I think that the best case, I mean, like you're saying, absolutely requires just the the global effort. And basically, you know, in this case, the best case is uh, we're sort of limited that we can't actually expect exactly what we have had in the last, say, few decades. Um, it's sort of a geophysical impossibility almost, but we can really mitigate things quite a bit beyond the, the very worst effects. And so right. I think... And, and there could be some incredible new technology that totally changes the game. Like, I'm just, I'm just coming up with ideas off the top of my head, but imagine if we had something that sucked carbon out of the atmosphere, like maybe even from space, and it was powerful enough that it was just able to like pretty much solve our problems. It doesn't exist, but I'm saying there could be some great innovation that could seriously change things, but we can't count on that. We can't count on there being some massive deus ex machina to come in at the last minute and save us. We've got to take all the small steps to get there. Mm -hmm. All right, well, let's bring it home into the most likely scenario. So what do you think is the most likely scenario for climate change? Most likely scenario. So, as you could probably anticipate, then I'll hedge my bets and end up between the the best and worst case, uh, you know, um, scenarios put out in these reports. But it's not just because they're, you know, the middle ones. But I really do think it sort of encompasses the most likely sorts of things that that would happen. So, like we're, you know, the rapid and you know, unilateral global movement and action that we were just describing in the best case scenario. I mean, we, you know, right now we don't see it happening. I mean, just in the few years since the Paris Agreement, we're already getting to the point where we're making it impossible to follow through on the demands every year that we wait to, to do that. It just seems, you know, unlikely to expect that to all of a sudden just come to fruition in, in a year or so. Um, but on the flip side, there are these encouraging trends that make me think that these worst case scenarios actually are just that they are the worst case they're an extreme end member that basically require a total lack of global movement and so um, where we're at right now seems to be some struggle you know some power struggle some occasional forward and backward you know two steps forward one backward sort of thing depending who's 
calling the shots at what time and which, you know, a certain interval you may make a lot of progress and policymaking and others uh, regress a bit. And so what that would put us at is something like these these middle scenarios uh, in, in one of the nicer papers I was reading about the, the committed climate change and basically factoring in this uh, also the probabilistic um, models for things like population growth and uh, GDP changes in this said, you know, within their 90% confidence interval, we're going to be between two and five degrees. And that's quite a big range, mm-hmm. but that's not eight and it's not 1.5. And I think then the, the take home for me is we should have a, a real conversation about, all right, let's make it three degrees, not four. And let's make it less than three if we can, for instance, and let's, uh, you know, let's not throw away the one and a half for the two degrees C goal. Let's do everything as ambitiously as ambitiously as we can. But I think take in mind that every bit that we can, you know, regain counts and mm-hmm. that it's not just that there's, oh, OK, if we miss this one, then how about we can just go up to the next uh, scenario? It's like, no, we should just really try to do as much as we can. And I think that will get us away from what these worst case scenarios are. But at the same time, then, that's a bit it's a bit of a scary situation. And I think it's really important to quantify on, on the scientific level, not just the socioeconomic one, what it means to live in a world that's three versus four. Right. Years. Yeah, I mean, I read this paper called Half Earth, where it was basically showed a most likely scenario of climate change where half of the Earth is that's currently livable is unlivable. And the other half just you know, there's there's more demands on it. More people want to move there. It gets more populated and, you know, not necessarily a bad thing, but there's going to be a lot of economic or uh, climate migrants. And in my most likely scenario, I see it when I think about what's actually the most likely to play out. I do think the U.S. is going to come around to climate change agenda Uh, whether it's in the next election or the one after that, it's going to happen. But like I said, that's only 15% of global climate emission or carbon emissions. So when I look at the other countries that have the biggest impact, I am actually really hopeful for China because of their long-term planning capabilities and because of what they've already put out to the public about their plans for going green and green energy and I think they are going to be the de facto leader of the climate efforts in in the next you know century, and but I think that other countries like Brazil you know wants to deforestation the whole Amazon rainforest. Those countries and any other countries that are poorer that don't and that don't have as much long term planning capabilities and that are more nationalistic and just care about themselves. I would also put India in that category. Those countries are not going to take the appropriate steps towards climate change. And what I actually think is going to happen in the most likely scenario is that China and possibly the U.S., but definitely China, is going to flex its international muscles and may even go into some of these countries and force them to have the appropriate emission levels. Like I could see a situation where you know, Brazil is like, hey, we're we're cutting down all these trees. You can't do anything. They're ours. And China just goes in there and is like, I dare you, <laughs> basically, and forces them not to. Uh, and, you know, China's power is just vastly increasing. And a lot of times on this podcast, we talk about the potential dangers of a country like China, you know, with privacy and, and freedom of the individual and things of that nature. But when you actually look at the collective good of what is good for just humans to survive in general, I actually think China is one of the strongest positive forces in that department. And I could see a similar thing with India where, you know, India is incredibly corrupt and incredible. There's so many particulates in the air. There's so many pollu- so much pollution. Nine million people die uh, as a result of air pollution every year already. Okay. And I, I think it's going to require China, maybe the U.S., maybe some other forward thinking countries to basically force these other countries that are the big pollutants to get their act together. 
And I think that once it becomes a point of national pride, like once China gets its submissions under wraps, once the U.S. gets its submissions under wraps, and once India is like, okay, you guys are just the worst of the worst of the worst now, then I think the Indian people's pride will become activated and they actually will be driven to make a change. And all of this is going to result in the same thing that you projected, you know, four, five, six degrees, something like that in the most likely case. Um, but that's how I think it's going to play out on a geopolitical scale. Yeah, I think it's an interesting question that countries like the U.S. have had the benefit of being able to go through this growth, uh, this curve in our carbon intensity, where at first it was increasing as we were developing as a nation. It was an extremely important time for the establishment of the U.S. as a global power. And it stands to reason that these other countries on a human level deserve an opportunity to develop as a country. And it's coming at a very difficult nexus here of needing to cut down globally on carbon emission, what that means economically for a developing country. Um, and I can only hope that, you know, the development can just go right into this sort of greener energy type uh, economy so that you can avoid a lot of that up and down trend in the carbon intensity curve. But yeah, that's going to be, I think, a big part of it the way it plays out yeah we are all well, i think that's a good place to end it so thank you everyone for listening this has been the future of climate change what has happened thank you what kip for joining us being our in-house expert the past the present and the future our computer